What'd you get, rock stars? 40. 40. 40. 40. You got it right. Okay, anybody not getting that yet? Drink my water. Okay, let's do a couple more just to make sure you got it. Okay, now this one here, I just want to tell you a couple things so you don't get confused, okay? Mm -hmm. You can do this two different ways and you'll still get the same answer. But if you use the method we've been using, then you don't get yourself confused. So the last part of the formula says that we're giving 125 mLs per hour. So if you use that as your total volume and you use your hourly rate and take a time to drip factor, you'll get the right answer. If you decide you wanna use the 225, then you have to divide that times the 125 because that's how much we're giving per hour. So then your time is gonna be two hours, okay? Because if you take 225 and divide it by 125, that gives you two hours. So I suggest you just stick with the 125 per hour. If you just use that total volume there over the total time, which is what, one hour? Mm -hmm. In minutes, it's going to be 60. So 125 divided by 60 times the 10. You have Sorry. your volume, your time, and your drip factor. And that's going to give you the correct answer. Now, if I confuse anybody, let me know and I'll show you exactly what I mean on paper so you understand it. And listen, sometimes I screw up these math problems. So don't be embarrassed because I've been a nurse for 20 years. If I can screw it up, you can too. Anybody? Okay, what well, we get a far answer? 21. 21. Okay, rock stars, you got it. <coughs> okay. Now, what's our question say? How many milliliters over an hour? Okay, so now what's my issue? I'm looking for the total volume over the total time in hours, right? Right. But is that anywhere up there? No. Nope. No. So to get your total volume, you have to take your 18 and you multiply that times 60 because that will tell you how much is going per hour. So 18 times 60 is what? 1,080. Let me see. Yeah, 1,080. Can you see the whiteboard? Yes. Okay, so we have 18 times 60 equals 1,080. And then we take the 1,080, okay, and we divide that by our drip factor, which is 20. And what's that give us? Fifty-four. Four. 54. Okay, now, again, this is asking us mLs per hour, okay, and we only have drops per minute. So we're taking the amount of drops in each minute, and we're multiplying that to give us the amount of drops per hour. And then when we divide that by our drop factor, it tells us our mLs per hour. Everybody understand that? Again, you have to see what is the question asking me. And it's asking you mLs per hour. 
little bit trickier. All right, here's another one, same way, okay? It's asking us what? MLs per hour. So we're going to take our 48 and multiply that times 60 and divide the whole thing by 60. And we should come out with 48 probably because we're just doing the same math over and over, right? 48 times 60 divided by 60. Did everybody get 48? 48. Yep. Normally it wouldn't come out to the same answer, but in this case, because we're multiplying times 60 and then dividing by 60, it's gonna come out to the same answer. So it comes out to 48 mLs per hour. Does anybody need to go over any more of these? Okay, let's see if we can get up chapter two. Oh, where am I? I thought I was in L to R. Try this again. So chapter one that I went through, um, I just have to do a little edit on that and I'll be sending you guys out the YouTube link for that. It's ready to go. I already uploaded it to YouTube. I just have to cut the tip off of it. Why am I keep ending up in this course? I don't understand. Let's try it again. Delta R. Thank you.
Okay, today we're going to be going through uh, chapter two, which is really about um, theory, research, and evidence-based practice. As soon as this PowerPoint decides to open up for me. Oh, Ms. Sue, I have a question. Yes. Uh, the first exam that we have on December 9th, is that for the first four chapters? Uh, I believe it's for the first seven. Oh, the first seven. Okay. Yeah, your syllabi has your chapters laid out, like by exam. So you can also look um, on your course calendar that has them laid out um, by exam and it kind of tells you what chapters are in each exam. Plus your uh, prep use are kind of correlated that way also. They're set up with the exams, except for I think the final. I don't think you have prep you questions for your final exam. Okay. So uh, nursing has two essential elements. It has the body of knowledge and um, being able to apply that knowledge in nursing care and interventions. The body of knowledge gives us a rationale for completing our nursing interventions. And there's a growing knowledge base developed specifically for nursing through theory development and research. Rationales for your nursing interventions come from several different disciplines, and these disciplines include anatomy, physiology, chemistry, nutrition, psychology, and sociology. Knowledge itself is the awareness of uh, what we acquire through either learning or investigation. As a nurse, we collect, we organize, we arrange facts to build a knowledge base. And that knowledge base is really relevant to what our personal experience or reality is. The knowledge base for, for professional nursing practice is um, made of several different disciplines, nursing science, uh, philosophy, ethics, biology, psychology. Uh, it also includes the social, physical, economic, organizational, and technology sciences. So knowledge comes from different resources, okay? It can be considered traditional, authoritative, or scientific. So uh, traditional is something that's passed down from one generation to another. And it includes things um, and statements such as, why are we doing it this way? Well, we're doing it this way because we've always done it this way. It doesn't really have any research to support that that's the way we should have done it or that's the way we should be doing it. But because we've always done it that way, um, people continue, continually do it that way. So uh, one example of that is, you know, making uh, hospital corners on the, on the beds. How many of you are familiar with that concept of making those hospital corners? Back in the day, that's always how you had to prep the bed. When your instructor came in, that was the first thing they went to was to the bed to see if you made those hospital corners on the bed the way you were supposed to. Uh, authoritative, this comes from someone who's considered an expert and it's generally accepted as a truthful statement. It's based on how the person that is the expertise perceives the knowledge. So like a senior staff member, for example, is teaching you as a graduate nurse how to use, um, how to perform a technical procedure in a more efficient manner. And let's say they're teaching you how to do an IV catheter. Uh, whatever knowledge that that nurse has gained through experience, she's going to show you when she uh, shows you how to perform this procedure. And you as a student, you're gonna accept that as being the truth because you assume that because she's the authority and she's this experienced nurse that she's showing you or he is showing you the proper way to perform this procedure. So that's what we call authoritative type of knowledge. And then scientific knowledge is obtained through scientific methods. New ideas are actually tested and measured. And then uh, they use objective 
criteria to prove if everything about that research is true. And once we show that that is evidence-based practice is what it ends up becoming, and we show that it's more um, helpful for the patient, it does more good than harm, then we kind of go with that method. Now, there's a couple of things that have been ruled out in nursing. I talked about this a little bit the other day, like auscultating for a G-tube, okay? Uh, originally, that was a traditional type of method. Like there really wasn't a lot of research that showed us that this um, helped us to put the tube in the right spot. Uh, and then after so many years of traditional, people who were experts actually told us, oh, if you listen to this and you listen to this, you can determine that the tube is in the right spot. But now scientists and scientific methods show us that we actually can't prove that the tube is in the right place by using auscultation. So that was actually ruled out. The American Nursing Association does not actually even recognize that method anymore as being a valid method of checking for tube placement. So uh, what types of nursing knowledge influence us? So we have science, that's the uh, knowledge or um, the base of nursing. Uh, we have philosophy, this is study and wisdom the fundamental knowledge, the processes that we use to construct life. We have the process, the nursing process. This is that framework and that theory that helps guide us. And then we have different influences over history and over time that have guided nursing. Uh, the influences that we talked about that Florence Nightingale incorporated into nursing, changes that were made by society from World War II and other influences through the 18th and the 19th century. And then uh, the societal influences that we achieve from schools of nursing. So if a nurse was working in a, a long established hospital and she learned a scientific approach to administering IV injections, from a generation of nurses at the hospital, what type of knowledge would we call that? If a bunch of nurses from the hospital with experience showed her how to do these injections, what kind of knowledge would we consider that? Authoritative. Authoritative. I think it would be traditional. It's traditional. Oh, traditional. Um, wait a minute. I'm sorry, it's authoritative. Yeah. You're right. It's uh, Friday morning. I guess I didn't drink enough yet. All right. <laughs> hey, lighten up, guys. You're supposed to be laughing. All right. Traditional knowledge is when we pass it from one generation to another, and authoritative is when we pass it from an expert. Okay. Scientific is if we use scientific knowledge. But when someone teaches you something on the floor, like a nurse, and she's teaching you from evidence based practice, then it would be scientific. But if she's teaching you just merely from her expertise and what she's been taught, then it would be authoritative. And if she's just teaching you because it's something all the other nurses did, then it would be traditional. Uh, let me see if I could send my, I want to send my other PowerPoint to my email and bring the, it up instead of the one that I'm using, if you guys don't mind. Just because it's a little more in depth than this one. And I'm not really, it's not, mine's not really flowing with this one because it's not, um, it's different. So I tried to break some of the concepts down a little bit more for you guys. And that's the difference in uh, the one that's up here and the one that I have. So just give me one second. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. You guys yes. see a question up there? Yes. Okay, good, then we're in the right spot. Okay, so after reviewing several research articles, the clinical nurse specialist on a med surge unit rewrites the procedure on assessing placement of an NG tube. What source of nursing knowledge did the nurse use in this situation? Was it scientific? scientific. <clears throat> nurse knowledge. Uh... Okay, scientific, yes. I'm trying to get rid of this thing here so that we can see the whole screen.
Can you guys see the whole slide or no? Can you you see this thing on there? Full screen. Okay. The clinical nurse specialist uses scientific knowledge, which is gained through research-based scientific. Philo philosophical knowledge is not a source of nursing knowledge, but a type of general knowledge. Authoritative knowledge comes from an expert and is accepted as truth based on the person's perceived expertise. And then traditional is the part of the nursing practice passed down from generation to generation and not based on scientific inquiry. All right, so knowledge is gained from someone with a great deal of perceived experience um, is which type of knowledge? Gained from someone with a perceived type of experience. Is that on the authoritative? Okay, good. Authoritative knowledge comes from somebody with uh, and a perceived ex experience or an expert. So all sources of knowledge that we use in the collective body of knowledge constitutes the nursing profession. Uh, the three sources that provide nursing with important contributions are traditional and authoritative knowledge, and they are practical to implement, but they're, they include subjective data, uh, the useful list the usefulness is limited in a variety of practice settings because they don't really use evidence-based practice. Now, some authoritative knowledge may include some evidence-based practice depending on, you know, who instructed the nurse and what they showed the nurse when they were teaching her the different procedures or who she got her method from. But in general, um, it wouldn't be considered scientific unless we knew that for a fact. So evidence-based care, that helps um, decision-making and that's based on the best available evidence and what else? Evidence-based care. What do we use with that to help us decide? So for this, we use um, outcome studies, okay? research and outcome studies to guide our decisions. So evidence-based practice, they're gonna actually do some sort of study. They're gonna actually research something. They'll probably use a hypothesis, okay? And they're gonna use the outcome of those studies to guide our nursing decisions. This is what we do with evidence-based practice. A nurse is caring for a client in an emergency room injured in a snowmobile accident. The nurse documents the following client data, uncontrollable shivering, weakness, pale and cold. On further assessment, the nurse notes a heart rate of 53 and a core internal temperature of 90. The nurse creates a plan of care and monitor the client, monitors the client to evaluate the outcomes. The nurse is using which type of problem solving in the care of this client? Scientific knowledge. Does everybody agree with that? Come on, y'all talk up. Now this is how you're gonna learn this stuff for the exam. The more you talk about it, the more you're gonna learn it. Scientific problem solving is a systematic seven step problem solving process that involves identifying the problem, collecting the data, formulating the hypothesis, creating a plan of action, testing the hypothesis, interpreting the results, evaluating the results in a conclusion or a revision of the study. And it's used most correctly in a controlled laboratory setting, but is also closely related to general problem solving processes that are often used by healthcare professionals when they work with clients, such as in the nursing process. So, you know, with the nursing process, we use ADPI, right? Analysis, diagnosis, uh, interventions, evaluations. <clears throat> so
So nursing knowledge uh, was influenced by Florence Nightingale and other researchers and theor theorists and also those society changes. Nightingale influenced it by practicing and demonstrating the efficient, knowledgeable nursing care by defining nursing practice as a separate and distinct from the medical practice and differentiating between health nursing and illness. So, you know, back in the day, they just looked as us as sick people. So if somebody was sick, they looked at them at that. They didn't look as wellness as being a part of the one of the essential components. So if we're well and we can prevent, do things to prevent illness, then overall that's going to help us as a person. So Florence Nightingale brought some of this knowledge into the nursing aspect. Uh, initially, we talked about how nurses were trained under the direction and control of the medical profession. And um, because of theoretical ideas for the nursing practice, we were able to bring the nursing um, separate from the medical, okay? And even though we struggled, eventually nursing has been able to grow and establish some of its own identity and receive recognition for contributions that it has made to healthcare. So some of those early schools of nursing were adapted from Florence Nightingale's ideas or her model, um, but they had no planned educational curriculum. Knowledge was just obtained from the lectures of the physicians or through practical experience that the nurses gained as they cared for the sick people in the hospital. The service orientation for nursing education gained its strongest influence on the nursing practice in the 1950s. And then nursing care began to be carried out um, still under the control and direction of the hospital administrator or the physician that practices in that hospital. So it still didn't have a clear identity of its own at that point. Originally, nursing care was based on traditional ideas and common wisdom that nurses learned from taking care of others. Uh, and then they started to learn more facts uh, about the scientific principles. During the first half of the 20th century, uh, we had that change because World War I and II, mostly World War II, okay, the soldiers went away, women came out of the home and started working in the workforce. They became more independent and they started to look for higher levels of education. At the same time, okay, education on nursing began to fo focus more about um, nursing itself, nursing research, more than just the hands-on training. So they actually wanted to give us a knowledge base, not just show us by hand and teach us like a trade or a skill. With that knowledge base, it gives us a higher level of learning and a higher level of understanding. So in the mid 20th century, this idea of nursing as a science became more accepted. Philosophical beliefs and a knowledge base for nursing practice started to evolve. And then we developed these graduate nursing programs, including the PhD in nursing. It's still not the same as the PhD in other um, areas. So we have to continue to lobby and fight. And part of the reason for this is because it was a predominantly female business. So, you know, if you want to become a medical doctor, there's only one route to that. But if you want to become a doctor or nursing, there's two different routes. Okay, that's nursing is the only profession that is like that. Every other profession only has one route or one basis, one set of criteria to become a doctor. Who is considered to be the most or the first theorist in conceptualized nursing in terms of manipulating the environment? Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale. Okay, yes, Florence Nightingale conceptualized the nurse's role. She taught us how to manipulate the environment to facilitate and encourage um, repairing the patient, okay, overall. And this is accomplished by attending to things such as proper ventilation, warmth, um, light in the area, okay, because a dingy, dirty, dark area doesn't promote healthcare. Uh, we need good ventilation, and we'll, that'll be proven more and more as things like COVID and stuff like that start to prevent, 
uh, present itself into our environments. We need good nutrition, good diet, uh, cleanliness, and noise. Okay, if it's too noisy for some people, um, that stimulation is not good, and for other people, not enough stimulation. So you know, we have to have that middle, um, right in the middle there, that is equal for all patients. That um, is a good level that they can function in and not be too over or too un under stimulated. So nursing as a profession has found it difficult for many years to establish recognitions for its contributions to healthcare. What explanation can be provided for this dilemma? So we know D is not true, right? They weren't independent. They worked under the direction of the hospital and the physicians, right? How about C, were they taught by other nurses? No. Not really, they were taught by the physicians and the hospital administration. And were they too busy to increase public awareness associated by the role of the nurse? That's not really the reason for this, right? The reason is because the actual conceptual and theoretical basis for the nursing practice came from outside of the nursing profession. So again, when you're answering these questions, try to think about what's true versus what's not true. It'll help you sort out the ones that are wrong and get to the right answer. You should be able to, to get to at least two. So Florence Nightingale's belief in the uniqueness of nursing, training of nurses, was initially carried out under the direction and control of the medical profession. Because the conceptual and theoretical basis for nursing practice came from outside of the profession, nursing struggled to establish its own identity and receive recognition for contributions to healthcare. Which statement most accurately describes Florence Nightingale's influence on nursing knowledge? So we have Nightingale defined nursing practice as the continuation of the medical practice. Is that true? B. E? B, Nightingale differentiated between health nursing and illness nursing. That's true. Did she establish a training for nurses with the curriculum designed by nurses? I hear crickets out there, guys. Crickets. Nightingale established a theoretical base for nursing that originated from the medical practice. All right, so she definitely uh, differentiated between health nursing and illness nursing. She influenced nursing knowledge and practice by differentiating between health nursing and illness nursing. She defined nursing practice as separate and distinct from the medical practice. Most early schools of nursing established in the United States were adapted from her model. There is no planned educational curriculum. Nightingale established the theoretical base. All right, so the types of nursing knowledge and the influences on nursing knowledge. So types are science. Science includes the knowledge in and of nursing. Philosophy, this is the study of wisdom, fundamental knowledge, and processes that we use to construct life. Process, the nursing process is a conceptual framework and theory. And then we have influences. Historical influences are Florence Nightingale and those societal changes that occurred because of those wars and some other things that were happening in society. And then other societal influences included those school of nursing. Remember, they adapted 
some of the models that Florence Nightingale created. So theory, this is a group of concepts that help describe a pattern of reality. Theories can be tested, changed, or used to provide research, all right? And they can also help us evaluate different things. They're obtained through different principal methods. So deductive reasoning, this is where we examine a general idea and we consider a specific action or idea. That's deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the is where we use the reverse process and we build from a specific idea or action to create a conclusion about a general idea. So remember deductive, we examine the idea and then we take an action or consider an action. In inductive, we take the idea and we try to form a conclusion about that idea. With deductive reasoning, uh, we're examining general ideas and we consider specific actions or ideas. And with inductive, we're building from specific ideas to create conclusions about those general ideas. So here's an example. Does Lucy like bananas? So if we were using deductive reasoning, we would say monkeys like bananas and Lucy is a monkey. So therefore, Lucy likes bananas. That's deductive. So we're taking the general idea, right, which is monkeys like bananas, and we're including that all monkeys will like bananas. For the inductive, we do an experiment, okay? So we give Lucy a banana to see if she likes the banana. She eats the banana, she enjoys the banana, so we determine from that experiment that she likes the banana. In nursing theory, uh, it differentiates from other disciplines and activities. It serves as the purpose for why we do things, um, for why we describe, why we explain, why we predict, why we control, why we want a desired outcome, okay? It provides a means of testing the knowledge through research. It helps us expand our nursing knowledge and it helps meet healthcare needs of our patients in an ever-changing society. So it also helps us focus in on the patient's specific needs. Uh, we use a few different theories. You should be familiar with these. I see these being asked about on the exams. Okay, general systems theory. Uh, this is used in a wide range of in a wide range of disciplines. Okay, and the main thing about this is. It breaks whole things into parts to see how they work together as a system. For adaption theory, <clears throat> this is adjusting to living matter and other things that are in the environment. It's a continuous process that affects change and it involves an interaction and a response. So human adaptation occurs on three levels, the internal self, the social, you know, how others' behaviors affect us and the physical or biochemical reactions that occur within the body. Developmental theories, these are um, orderly. They help predict growth and development from the time we're born until death. Uh, they can be progressive. The behaviors um, of a person with each, within each one of our stages are unique. Things that can affect those um, stages are hereditary, the person's temperament, their emotional and physical status or environment, uh, how they are exposed to life experiences and how those life experiences affect them and their general overall health status and growth and development. So if someone has developmental delays or if they're um, enhanced in growth, okay, they're gonna experience things different and they're gonna see things different. So based on all of these components, okay, is explains how a person would develop and grow uh, in response to how things are happening to them. Which theory describes the maturation of humans through different stages? Adaptive. Developmental. 
remember developmental is like Erickson, Freud, uh, Jean Piaget. They talk about how we grow in developmental stages. Okay, so you act one way as a toddler, you act another way when you become preschooler, you act another way as a school age child, you act another way as an adolescent, uh, you act another way as an adult, and then you act another way as an older adult. So each one of these stages, we're going to act differently, like an infant, okay? An infant doesn't know about trust and bonding because it hasn't learned or acquired those skills yet. But it will learn about that, right? As the infant lays there in the bed and cries, how long should you allow that baby to cry before you go and you try to figure out why is my baby crying? Okay, and then you're going to go through a series of steps to try to stop that baby from crying. The same thing, when your child becomes a certain age, okay, it's going to start to want to pee or poop on the toilet like mommy and daddy or big brother or big sister. So some of those children are going to learn faster than others. So if you have a child that's 18 months old in the house and it's learning how to potty train and now you're pregnant and you have another baby and that baby is two months old, what might happen with that 18 month old? It might start to regress First. and go back to some of those behaviors that they used to engage in. Why? Because they want that attention back that now you're giving to that new baby. Okay? So the baby learns how to trust you based on your response time when that baby's crying. Are you able to fix that baby? Because usually babies want like a couple of things, right? They want milk. They want to be changed. And sometimes they want to be snuggled or cuddled. So generally, those three things are going to stop your baby's crying. And if they don't, then usually what's happening? Something else is wrong with your baby, right? And you're not going to wait. If your baby's crying, you're not going to wait, oh, I'll let it cry for 30 minutes and then I'll go see what it wants, right? You're not going to do that with a newborn because the newborn only has one way of signaling, signaling you when they need something. And that is crying. That's how they signal you, hey, I can't talk yet, but I could cry and interrupt your football game and let you know that, hey, I need a diaper change. I need some food. Which theory describes how humans adjust to life with other living things and the environment? Adaptation. That's adaptation. Adaptation is how we adjust. And a lot of times... What you'll see is with Sister Callister Roy, this is what she talks about. You'll see this when you start doing your care plans and we start talking about what is the focal stimuli for the patient? What is, are the other stimuli for these patients? And these stimuli are based on what is happening with the patient right now, okay? So I'm adapting to what is happening to me right now. Like, we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go on, but let's say your patient is in congestive heart failure, okay? Generally, people don't just go into congestive heart failure. Things have been going on in the body that they may have been ignoring, okay, or that they weren't following quite the game plan to do what they're supposed to, and so the congestive heart failure starts to get worse. But it's not that congestive heart failure that really brings the patient in to see the doctor, right? They don't come in and go, oh, my congestive heart failure is worse. I need to see you, right? No, it's the things that are causing them problems from that congestive heart failure, like the fact that they can't breathe because they have all this fluid on their lungs now. That's what brings them into the hospital. As long as they were to, able to engage, as long as they were able to eat okay, they were able to have sex okay, they were able to wash their clothes all okay, they were able to go to work all day, they're not going to the doctor, right? I, I... How often do you go to the doctor? When something's wrong, right? Something's wrong. If everything's right, do you go to the doctor? Not at How all. How many people go for wellness visits or once a year annual visits? No. You don't go, right? Unless <laughs> something's wrong or you need a piece of paper for school or work. Then you go. So people with congestive heart failure are no different. If their congestive heart failure is causing them problems, but it's not interrupting their everyday life. Sometimes they'll let things slide and they won't report it or they don't go into the physician. So they're 
engaging in ba behaviors to help them adapt with what's going on. All right, so that's where adaptation theory. So when you think about it, think about I'm adjusting to things that are happening in my body. I'm adjusting to things around me, my environment, and my life. And then remember, general systems is breaking down those little parts, right? And putting them together to see how they all work together as a whole, right? So my Legos, they're all separate parts. But when I put all those Legos together, I can create this dynamic building or this dynamic airplane, or I can make the, um, what's that ship? The Titanic ship out of all these Legos if I put them all together. So they work differently than they do together. And that's how the body works also. The parent has brought the six-year-old child into the clinic. The parent is concerned that the child does not seem to skip as well as other children in the class. In planning assessments and care for this child, the nurse would be best served by choosing which theory as a foundation for decision-making. C. C. Okay, C, developmental theory is concerned with growth and development across the lifespan, and this would provide a foundation for assessment and care of the child. None of the other theories listed is concerned with maturation of the child. Maslow's theory talks about what? Our needs, your basic, your basic needs. Physical needs. Okay, good. You know, your physical needs, uh, your self-esteem, you know, how you get along with others in society. So it grows from the very basic to the highest level. And you want to know what those levels are because that's going to help you prioritize how you answer questions. A nursing theorist examines the hospital environment by studying each ward and how it works individually and then relates the information to the hospital as a whole working entity. This is an example of which theory? General systems. General systems. Okay, good. General systems. All right. So we're looking at each part individually and then we're looking at how they break into parts and how they work together as a whole. So we'll be talking about different theorists, um, those that have made important contributions to the developmental theory. Uh, we're only gonna talk about two here, okay? And these are Eric Erickson and Abraham Maslow. So Erickson's theory was based on psychosocial development. Uh, the process of socialization, emphasizing how people interact with the world. And he recognized the role of all components, social, biological, and environmental in development. And he defined specific tasks or conflicts that people accomplish or overcome when he defined the eight stages of life. So what he says basically is that it's hard for them to progress to the next stage of life if they haven't accomplished the task or if they currently have conflicts in a different stage of life. Abraham Maslow developed Sears theory of human needs in terms of physical and psychosocial components um, that are considered essential to human life. So he talks about chronological age. Um, I mean, he talks about components essential to human life where Erickson talks about chronological age. So benefits of nursing theory, they help us to uh, work towards a common goal. They help us to improve patient care. It provides a rational, knowledgeable reason for why we perform our nursing actions. It helps give us a knowledge base for actions that we need to perform and it helps resolve current nursing issues. It also helps prepare nurses um, to question different assumptions and values so that's part of your critical thinking skills, and it serves as research, education, and practice. A lot of, 
Sorry, I went the wrong way. We have a lot of theories to think about. Okay, descriptive theories. These um, use a phenomenon, an event, a situation, or a relationship, and they help identify different properties or components, okay, of the circumstance or how it occurs. Prescriptive theories talk about nursing interventions and the consequences of those interventions, and they help us control, promote, and change the clinical nursing practice. We use theoretical frameworks to provide a focus for nursing care activities. The person receiving the care is our central theme, but how each theorist defines that person, the environment, the health, and nursing gives us a unique focus specific to that uh, specific theory. The ultimate goal of each framework is to provide holistic patient care and be able to individualize each um, treatment so that we meet the patient's goals the patient's needs, we promote health, and we help prevent or treat the different illnesses in each patient. So the most important concept of nursing is the, the person. That's the most important thing in the theory. All right, four common um, concepts to all nursing theories are person, environment, health, and nursing. But the most important concept is the person. So Sister Callista Roy, okay, that's what your care plan is going to be um, based on. She believed that humans are biopsychosocial beings. They exist within the environment and their needs are created within uh, these interrelated adaptive modes of physiological self-concept, how they function in their role and interdependence. So really, if you think about it, like what kind of physiological state do they have? What are their concepts and beliefs and values? How do they function in their everyday roles? And how does the current illness or what's going on with them affect that? And how do they function with people around them, their family, you know, what are their um, support systems? Are they involved with those support systems? And how do those support systems help them when they cope? Nursing interventions are required when people demonstrate an ineffective adaptive response. So if the person doesn't respond to that stressor or they don't cope or um, if they're not doing well with what's going on, then we have to... Um, cater our nursing interventions to help that person be able to get back to their everyday level of functioning and to be able to adapt and function within uh, the new um, role that they have encountered now because of this illness or because of what's taking place in their life. So in other words, I might be the husband, the father, and the main caregiver. Does that matter really in the United States right now? Do I need to maintain that role? But how about if I'm Muslim or how about if I'm um, Arabic and now I can't um, perform in that role? Is that going to affect how people in society look at me, how I look at myself and how my family looks at me? Okay. What do you think? Yes. Because, you know, one of the things that we know is that in certain cultures, the male is the dominant person, right? He's the one that runs the household. Now, if he can't do that, how's that going to affect him? Not only physiologically, but psychologically. And that, how's that going to affect the way other people around him think? Now, with Florence Nightingale, her thought was to be able to meet the personal needs of the patient within the environment be able to care for the environment of the patient. So if I could make sure that the patient has a well-ventilated area to be in, it's well clean, uh, the temperature is maintained, it's well lit, they have good nutrition and we can reduce the noise, then I can help that patient heal better and faster. And a lot of that stuff we know today to be true because um, we use sterility and stuff like that, which originally wasn't used back in the day. Like people didn't wash their hands the way they do today, even before COVID. 
obviously people didn't wash their hands the way they do today, right? Because otherwise there wouldn't be such a shortage probably in soap and all that stuff, unless the manufacturers <laughs> are doing that on purpose so that they can um, increase the cost of it to the consumer, which, you know, is a possibility. Because they're all about the profit. Uh, Virginia Henderson, she was another uh, theorist. Her idea was that the patient is a person. They require help uh, to reach independence. So nursing practice is independent. We can do autonomous nursing functions. What are some of those autonomous nursing functions that we can do? So we can encourage fluids, right? If a patient's not ambulating or has had surgery, we can encourage them to get up and ambulate. We can encourage them to deep breathe. We can do things like helping them turn, right? These are things that we can do on our own that don't require a physician's order. And it's things that's going to help the patient achieve a better status of health, right? So we do have some autonomy in the nursing profession that we can use. Questions, anybody? Not yet. Okay, so Jean Watson, okay. Um, she was concerned with promoting and restoring health, preventing illness, caring for the sick, all right? Um, she wanted the clinical component to be holistic, to help promote health and quality of living. So we already know that if we can do health promotion, we can prevent certain illnesses, right? Like a lot of cancers we can prevent by just not smoking, by not eating fried fatty foods, um, by exercising, okay? Like just little stuff that we can do every day that can help promote our health. So we've learned this over time. Dorothea or Orem. She, um, her theory was about self-care being a human need. When we don't take good care of ourself, then it requires nursing actions. Now, sometimes we see this just in certain people that aren't able to take care of themselves physically, but we also have a variety of people in the population who mentally cannot take care of themselves because they're too depressed or because they have you know, mental illness. So they're not able to really take care of themselves. And then, you know, some people can't do it because of developmental issues. Either developmentally, they're not at the appropriate age to take care of themselves and they require assistance from one of us or developmentally, they have some issue. Um, they're delayed and so they can't take care of themselves either because they just don't know how. Uh, Lydia Hall, she focused on rehab and um, this encompassed nursing's autonomy, uh, the therapeutic use of self-treatment within the healthcare team and nurturing care. So, you know, the major outcome of nursing care is rehabilitation and feelings of self-actualization by the patient. So what does that really mean? Well, when, we, when someone's sick, we wanna return them to their previous level of functioning. So sometimes it's gonna require rehabilitation for that to happen and also for them to understand things that they need to know and things that they need to do to help themselves grow. And so sometimes we do this through teaching the patient, um, showing them different ways to care for themselves because sometimes they don't know the right way. And then we might send them to places like cardiac rehab or physical therapy after they've been in the hospital for several days or whatever from an illness. And we wanna to try to get them back to the normal feeling because you know when you lay around in a hospital bed, you're not eating and you're not engaging you're gonna be weak after that fact. Uh, if someone has a heart attack, they're gonna be weak after that fact. So they're gonna to have to return their body back to that previous level of functioning or as close to that as they can. And there's only so much we can do for them in the hospital because they're only gonna be there for a couple of days. 
after the hospital, they might go to a rehab. And then after that, they're going home. So we have to teach them in that short period of time how they can do as much as they can to achieve uh, rehabilitation themselves, to get their own self back to that you know, feeling of independence. And sometimes self-actualization by the patient can help them do that. So uh, as a professional nurse, uh, we use research, okay, and theories to collect, organize, and classify data. It also helps us understand, analyze, and interpret the patient's situation. So if you ever um, seen a definition of critical thinking, sometimes what you'll see on there is that you're able to analyze, interpret, um, that you'll look for correlations or patterns, okay? Because these correlations and patterns amongst different things help us to understand. Like if you understand that um, if a person um, takes in too much sodium, water might follow that sodium, right? Not always, but a lot of times it will because that's what it does. And if you understand that, then you might understand how someone who is retaining too much sodium is also having a problem with fluid overload. Um, you'll understand why someone with potassium needs to be on a cardiac monitor because you understand that the consequences of the potassium levels being off because calcium affects the ability of muscle to function and your heart is a giant muscle, you understand that if potassium is not um, the way it should be at the levels where it should be, that it could cause a problem with this person's cardiac rhythmia or cardiac pattern. Uh, theoretical concepts and theories help to guide the different phases of the nursing process. And this includes planning, implementing and evaluating care it also helps describe and explain the desired or expected responses and the outcomes of care. And this all goes together. It'll go together for you when you're asking questions and when you're answering those questions. Because when you read a question and you know you read the question, it asks you something, and then you look at your answers in the question. When you're looking at your answer in the question, especially if these are analysis questions, you know, if I pick this answer for my patient, and so your question might be, um, you have four patients in the room, which patient is the priority to see? Well, you have to determine which one is priority because if you pick the wrong patient, then what's the outcome going to be? Well, the outcome going to be is the patient that you didn't pick is either going to code or going to die. Okay, so if you know what the, you have four patients there and you know that one has a circulation problem, one has an airway problem. Um, you know, one has a sodium problem and one has something else. Which one are you going to pick? Well, which one's going to kill them the first? The, the airway. Okay. Right. Because if the airway is obstructed, how long do you have to fix that? Seconds. Seconds. If someone's bleeding out, how long do you have to fix that? Minutes. A few minutes, right? So you're not going to go for something that is going to fix the person in minutes over something that would fix them in seconds, right? Because your patient's going to die. So even if you fix the bleeding problem, if they have an obstruction in the airway, they're still going to die because that is going to kill them a lot quicker. So when you're looking at you know, your answer choices, what is going to be the outcome if I pick this choice? You know, you're in a room with a patient and this is how you have to picture yourself. I'm in a room with a patient and I'm looking at this patient and I have one thing that I can do and then leave the room. So I'm not going on break for 15 minutes. I'm not going to reassess or recheck the blood pressure if my blood pressure was just taken because that's not going to tell me anything. What can I do right now to help this patient that isn't going to make them any worse? So when I leave the room, that patient's not going to belly out on me or die on me because that's my nursing license if I make the wrong choice. All right. It's going to be your nursing license if you make the wrong choice, not to mention the fact that your patient might die. And that might be more detrimental to you than losing your license is not being able to understand what you did wrong that ultimately killed your patient. 
that you maybe could have saved. I mean, there's going to be times when you can't save your patient no matter what you do. But what about the times when you can, but you didn't because you made the wrong move? And that's what you have to think about. And even worse yet, than killing your patient is putting them in a body where they can't move or in a mind where the body can't move. And sometimes you could do that just by making the wrong choice. Um, okay, so um, we develop explanations through theories. We help to find solutions to the patient's problem. We help improve that level of care that the patient is receiving. Um, and as nursing, we develop more autonomy, autonomy and we develop strength as the nurse. We also are able to provide evidence-based care or show that, hey, research supports the moves that we made. We can show that we did the right thing because we have research and studies that show that. And that's what's going to make nursing dynamic and strong and a great profession. So when we talk about uh, clinical research, we talk about uh, carefully examining, okay, using a scientific process that helps us observe and verify specific information. The information has to be collected in a systematic manner. And that information is going to help describe, explain, or predict certain events. So what's an example of this? So like an example of this is um, catheter um, in, in, um, induced infections in the hospital, okay? That's one of the biggest things that they do a lot of research on. So what are some of the things that they have now told you about nursing that didn't used to apply when it comes to putting a catheter in a patient? Now we know one, you have to use sterile procedure, right? Two, you're not putting a catheter in anyone who doesn't absolutely need one. Three, um, we're not gonna leave it on any longer than we absolutely have to. And four, there's specific care that we have to use to take care of when we're taking care of this catheter. If we don't, then the catheter is more likely to induce infection and cause the patient more harm than good. So um, value, okay, value helps us um, determine um, the, how good that the knowledge is, okay? And how we'll be able to use it in our research. Um, what type of value will it provide to us? So like I was just talking about the um, healthcare acquired infections of the um, catheters, okay? The value of doing the research on those catheters helped us reduce the amount of catheter induced infections in these hospitals. Why is that important to us? Why do you guys think? Well, for one, it reduces the patient's risk for infection. Now, if they acquired an infection in the hospital because of something I as the healthcare person did, who do you think's paying for that care? The hospital is going to get stuck with that bill, guys, because Medicare says they wouldn't have got that in infection if you didn't do something wrong. Like if you would have washed your hands more, if you would have cleaned that catheter more often, if you would have used sterile technique, they wouldn't have these infections. So we're not paying for it. The hospital's going to pay for it. So what happens when you have a patient in the hospital and they're supposed to be in there for three days because they had um, let's say they had um, congestive heart failure and the reason why you had to put the um, catheter in is because you're monitoring kidney function, the use of furosemide, the intake and output because you know you're, this patient's at risk for dehydration or something. So you need to monitor their I and O. And in the process of putting that catheter in, now they got an infection. So instead of staying three days, now they're staying 10 days. Medicare is only paying for those first three days. If that infection caused that patient to stay in the hospital another seven days, the hospital is now going to be responsible for paying for that care, anything associated with that infection. Or if that infection caused the patient to get worse, the worsening of that disease process, the hospital is going to be stuck with that bill. Medicare is not going to pay it because the Medicare is going to say to the hospital, well, you know what? you should have followed the proper guidelines. 
you should have followed this, that, and the other thing to prevent the patient from getting sick. And since you didn't do that, we're not paying that portion of the bill. So that's why it's important because if the hospital had to do that every time a patient is admitted, they'd be out of business. They can't afford to pay their own bills. They need the insurance company to pay those patient bills. Validity, okay? We do um, a method, a methodology, okay? To um, make sure that the study is correct, okay? So we go over it and over it and over it to make sure it's precise and that the information we're delivering from this test is true, um, that we've gone through everything to rule out any possible um, thing that might invalidate it, okay? And that we've looked at things like planning, data collection, analysis, and reporting. Uh, fair subjects, okay? So when we use people for studies, there's certain criteria that we have to include when we wanna use somebody for a study. Like we can't use people that are vulnerable. We can't take advantage of people who don't understand. Um, maybe we're doing a study and we gave them like all this um, in-depth contract to sign and it's not legible. The, the average person couldn't understand the contract. Um, they wouldn't, it was above their developmental level. Well, really in a court of law, that wouldn't hold up. Your patient has to fully understand like why you're doing this study. Um, they can't be privileged or vulnerable to these studies. So like when Trump went out and said that, you know, he took this uh, medication that wasn't available to everybody else. It was only available to him. Well, that's unethical. You have to make, everything has to be fair. So you wouldn't say, oh, let's just go ask the people in this poor neighborhood because they need money. We'll just go ask them if they want to participate in the study and we'll pay them an exorbitant amount of money because they're going to be vulnerable to doing that study because they desperately need the money. Even though the study could cause potential harm to them, they're not gonna think about that at the time because they need that money. So they don't care if it's gonna cause them harm. What they care about is, can I live today? Can I live tomorrow? And if I get this money, I'll be able to do that. So we have to make sure that we're not subjecting people that are vulnerable or privileged um, to unfair selections, putting them at risk, um, or giving them benefits that they shouldn't be entitled to, okay, just because they are either one person or another um, based on their level of who they know or who they don't know. Uh, favorable bis risk, I'm sorry, favorable risk benefit ratio. So you always have to think about this in the clinical aspect, and sometimes you even have to document on this. So an example of this would be, let's say that your patient has a um, G-tube and you need to give the patient a specific medication. The medication doesn't come in a uh, liquid form. It only comes in a pill. And if you read the manufacturer's pill information, it says on there not to crush it. But if you don't give the patient the pill, they're gonna continue to have seizures and you've tried other pills and other things and they haven't worked. Only this pill works. And because the patient has a G-tube, we have to go against the pharmaceutical advice and crush it. All right, that is an example where the risk might outweigh, uh, I mean, where the benefits might outweigh the risk. So in other words, if we don't give the patient this medication, they're gonna to continue to have seizures. If we do give it, yes, it's a risk for us to crush it and give it through the tube. But what is more of a risk? Is it more of a risk crushing it and giving it through the tube? Or is it more of a risk not giving it at all? If we don't give it at all, the patient's gonna to continue to have seizures. And what does that do? It interrupts the electrical activity of the heart and the brain. So the patient could be hypoxic. Um, it could cause them to have further brain damage or to have a massive heart attack. So again, you would present this to the physician and really they're gonna make that decision. And then they could actually write a note that says, allow the nurse to crush the medication because the benefits outweigh the harm. They, you would want them to document that and you would give them the paper and make them give you an actual order 
to crush this medication, okay? Because you can't just decide on your own, oh, it's better for the patient, so I'm going to crush it and give it that way. You still have to have orders, and you still have to have documentation that back this. Uh, independent reviews. So this is when somebody from the outside that's not affiliated, that has no benefit, they're not going to gain anything by looking at this. And they come in from the outside and they do a review and they determine whether the research should be used or not. Um, and they usually do it based on, you know, facts, okay, facts and studies. Informed consent. Okay, just like we do informed consent for patients that are having surgery, if someone's going to um, participate in clinical research, we need their consent. And we have to tell them what all the benefits are, what all the risk factors are. And then once we tell them that, then we allow them to make their own decision, and it should be voluntary. We shouldn't sway them in any way or try to co coerce them in any way to do this, okay? It should be totally up to them in the end whether they decide to do this or not. Um, they also should have the opportunity to withdraw at any time they decide, all right? Privacy should be protected, and things should be well monitored. Now, sometimes things might be released from a study that doesn't indicate um, there's no way for it to be like if I looked at that information, I couldn't tell who the patient was about. So sometimes information is released from these studies. But when it's released, it's released in a manner that I can read the information and not associate it with a particular subject. So Nightingale started with the record keeping, okay, during the Crimean War. In the 50s and 60s, nursing research was starting to develop um, recognition, okay, and it became important, and we started to use it uh, with our practice. In the 70s and 80s, clinical research became more emphasized, and then in 1993, the National Institute for Nursing research was actually established and formed. And it helped to provide funding to do the research. Research is an essential component of nursing, and it's defined as such by the American Nursing Association, by the International Council of Nursing, and by other uh, organizations. What types of research or methods do we use? We use quantitative and qualitative, and you have to know the difference between these, okay? So a couple of things to help um, separate them. All right, with quantitative, um, it talks about the basic and applied research. Uh, it generally is going to happen in a laboratory. It's also called practical research. Qualitative is based on a belief Okay, or a perception. Uh, research des design follows a lot of the same steps as quantitative, but it analyzes um, words or narratives, not numbers. So quantitative looks at numbers, qualitative talks about words or narratives. Also, quantitative is going to be more in the lab where qualitative may be a study. Um, over different phrases or a word that someone made a statement about something, okay? Quantitative research also is going to be descriptive. So it talks about um, and explores uh, real life situations. It identifies relationships between and among events and it's often used to genera generate knowledge about topics that don't have prior research. Correlational quantitative research is when we look at different types of degrees and relationships between two or more variables. So we're looking at how one thing correlates with another. All right, so in other words, um, like phos phosphorus and calcium, okay? How do they correlate? Well, if my phosphorus level goes up, my calcium level is gonna go down. 
So they're correlated to one another because if one happens, the other one is going to happen. Uh, Quasi-experimental quantitative research. This is where we talk about cause and effect. All right, so um, it's often conducted in the uh, clinical setting. All right, so in other words, um, if I put in a catheter into someone and I don't use sterile procedure, okay, the effect of that could be uh, an infection, right? But the cause of it is the fact that I didn't wash my hands or use sterile procedure, so I introduced organisms into the patient's body. Experimental is to examine cause and, and effect relationships under highly controlled conditions. So if we're doing experimental, again, that's going to be in the lab setting. For qualitative, we use more things like phenomenon. All right, so we're using philosophy and research. And we describe experiences as they are lived by the subject. So in other words, um, let's say I walk into the woods and I see a big, scary bear. What is my reaction to that? So the phenomenon is studying my reaction to that experience. Okay. So it's data about the experience and how the person related to that experience or what their reality is from that experience. So another example would be if I had a heart attack. How did I relate to that heart attack? How did it affect me personally? Because the way a heart attack affects me and the way it affects you might be two different things, right? And what kind of things can make a difference in that? Well, if I'm, again, if I'm the general breadwinner of the family, I'm the husband and the breadwinner of the family and I have a heart attack, that's going to affect me because now I can't be the breadwinner of the family because it's going to put me out of work. And if I do heavy lifting or something like that, and I don't have any other experience, it could keep me out of work. What if I'm mom in the home? Now my role model is just staying home, cleaning the house, cooking, things like that. I'm not going to be able to do that role anymore. So how is this going to affect me as a person? I'm going to feel like now I can't contribute to the family appropriately. It's going to affect my self-esteem, okay? It could cause me to have further heart attacks because it could put a tremendous amount of stress on me. The grounded theory. Uh, this, again, is qualitative. Okay, this is how people describe their own reality and their beliefs, okay, related to actions in a social scene. And this can vary from one person to the other, okay? I might think I did something out um, when I was out you know, and about that helped other people. Whether I actually helped other people or not, doesn't matter. If I believe that I helped other people, okay? So you're formulating the concept on how other people believe that their actions assisted others in the social context. So findings are grounded in data from the subjects that are used to formulate concepts and generate a theory of experience supported by the example from the data. So like you might use this in something like a um, group, let's say where you're talking to parents with a support group of uh, children that have something like um, leukemia, okay? Or Hodgkin's disease where these children are seriously ill and they're dying. How does each family or each parent cope with those particular children? Uh, ethnography. This is used by the discipline of anthropology. And so we study um, different cultures, okay, that are of interest to nursing. So how does each culture deal with certain things, right? One culture may deal with something different than another. And so like in America, we have certain cultures that look at drug addiction. They don't look at it as, as an illness, right? They look at it as something that people can control. Oh, they, they could do, they, they don't have to be an addict. They choose to be an addict. Okay. But in other countries, they look at it as an illness. So in other countries, drugs are not illegal. 
they're legal. And the reason why they're legal is because they know that people have an illness. They know that they can't control themselves. And it actually, when they approach people by making the drugs legal, it actually decreases the amount of addiction because it doesn't put this um, stigma on the drug addiction. That stigma on the drug addiction actually causes more stress and causes more people to be addicted. And that's their philosophy. Um, historically, okay, so historical, we look at events of the past and we try to understand how it affects nursing today. So when we look at these um, past studies, it talks about different nursing leaders and you know patterns of what we've done throughout the history of nursing. And we use those patterns to help improve things that we're doing in nursing practice today. So when we use quantitative research, we uh, state what our problem is. We define why we're creating the study. Um, we are going to look at literature that's related to that study. And then we have to formulate a hypothesis and the variables of the study. We determine what research design we're going to use. And those research designs we just talked about, OK, for both quantitative and qualitative. We also will set a population and a sample to collect the data from. We're going to analyze. The sample is usually a number. So let's say we're picking women that were pregnant in um, March of last year. OK, so that would be our population. Our sample would be the size. So let's say we wanted to study 1,000 women that were pregnant in March of last year. And maybe we're looking at to see if COVID had any effects on them, OK? So we select the population. We select a, a sample size. We collect the data. We analyze the data. We communicate those findings and the conclusions. So we would have a uh, dependent variable, an independent variable, a hypothesis, a data, and then what instruments are we using to collect that data? That could be things like surveys, um, you know, stuff along that lines. A nurse researcher must decide on the method for conducting the research. The researcher that plans to emphasize collection of numerical data and analysts would select which research method. Quantitative. 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 Yes, quantitative research uses numerical values and, st and statistical analysis of the data. A nurse is reading a qualitative study that focuses on nursing events of the past in an understanding to increase understanding, I'm sorry, in an attempt to increase understanding of nursing profession today. What method of qualitative research is used? Historical. Historical, good. Okay, the article uses historical methodology that examines events of the past to increase in understanding of the nursing profession today. Remember, phenomenology is used to describe experiences as they are lived by the subject being studied. Grounded theory discovers how people describe in their own reality and how their beliefs are related to the actions in a social scene. And ethnology examines issues of a culture that are of interest to nursing. The focus of nursing is always on which of the four common concepts in nursing theory. The patient. Okay, the patient, what else? There's four. The environment. The environment. The health. The health. Nursing. And nursing, okay. The focus is on the person, but all four concepts are important. 
person, environment, health, and nursing. A nurse who works in a pediatric practice assesses the developmental level of children of various ages to determine their psychosocial development. These assessments are based on the work of who? Eric Erickson, is it? Yep, Eric Erickson based his theory of psychosocial development on the process of socialization, emphasizing how people learn to interact with their world. Erickson recognized the role of social, biologic, and environmental, and environmental factors in development and defined specific tasks or conflicts that people accomplish or overcome during what he defined as the eight stages of life based on chronological age. So Erickson based his theory of psychosocial development on socialization and he emphasized how people interact with the world. He recognized the role of social, biological and, and environmental factors in development. He defined specific tasks or conflicts that people accomplish or achieve during the eight stages of life based on chronological age. Maslow developed his theory of human needs in physical and psychosocial needs considered essential to life. He defined five levels of need in a hierarchy with each need existing simultaneously. Jean Watson is a nursing theorist known for focusing on care. The central theme of her work is that nursing is concerned with promoting and restoring health, preventing illness and caring for the sick. Caring is universal and practiced through interpersonal relationships. The most common um, obstacles to nursing research include, uh, we don't have enough access to resources. It's limited uh, time to participate in the research and the activity, and we don't have uh, enough educational preparation needed by nurses for research. So the resources that we have access to are restricted. We have a limited time to participate in that research and there's a lack of educational resources prepared. So nurses who value evidence-based practice as an integral part of um, you know, their best clinical practices, they regularly read and they um, go through professional journals. They try to keep their practice up to date. Uh, they also value the need for continuous improvement in clinical practice. And so they're always uh, searching for new knowledge. Where are we at in the book as far as with that part? Um, this is all chapter two. So let me see. Page 36. Thank you, because I couldn't find it. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have the page number, sorry, correlated with the slides. I didn't do that part. But if you ever wanna know, remember how I showed you in the beginning about how you could go into that content part where it says book and search. So if you go in there and you just look up like any one of these topics, evidence-based research or quantitative um, or qualitative research, okay, and then you know your reference numbers for chapter two, your page numbers, it'll bring you right to this area if you just type it in that research bar, in that search bar. All right, so how do we incorporate um, evidence-based practice, okay? Evidence-based practice itself is uh, translational research that forms the bridge between theory and practice. So we do the evidence-based research, right? And then we incorporate it into our uh, interventions in our nursing practice. So first we have to um, come up with an inquiry. We see people doing this and we say, why? Why are they doing this? Okay, what is the benefit of me washing that catheter tube when the patient has the catheter already in? Well, the benefit is I can eliminate microorganisms that might be introduced into that reservoir, 
Okay, so you need a spirit of inquiry. You're unsure about why they're doing something and you wanna know why. So you ask this burning clinical question and you do it in what we call PICO format. And I would be familiar with that because you'll probably see some questions about it. All right, so we looking and collecting um, relevant data about the practice. We want to um, appraise the evidence, okay? Um, we do um, evaluation and synthesis and we're looking at the evidence to see if it makes sense. Is it true? Um, does it correlate with what we're doing? Uh, we integrate the evidence into our clinical expertise and we talk about and we consider our patient preferences and how does the patient value this? Okay, because this is going to help make a practice decision or a change. If our patient doesn't value what we're doing for them, and if we don't value, then sometimes the care won't make a difference or it won't work. We evaluate the outcomes of the practice decision, and then um, we decide to make a change based on the evidence that we've been able to prove. All right, and then we um, disseminate the outcomes of the evidence-based decision or the change or the um, procedure that we did that was different. So what was the outcome once we actually did it? And then we want to let people know was what that outcome was, because that shows that we either improved something or we didn't. So evidence-based practice itself is a problem-solving approach to making clinical decisions by using the best evidence that is available to us. It uses the art of science and nursing to uh, blend it together so that we get the best patient outcomes possible. It can consist of nursing interventions or guidelines established for the care of patients uh, regarding certain illnesses, treatments, or surgical procedures. When we use evidence-based practice, um, we also use analysis and systematic reviews of our findings then evidence-based practice itself blends the science and art of nursing so that the best patient outcome is achieved every time. Uh, John Hopkins nursing evidence-based practice model is a powerful problem-solving approach to clinical decision-making. And it's accompanied by friendly user tools to help guide uh, either the person or the group that's using it. It's designed specifically to meet needs of the practicing nurse, and it uses a three-step process called PET, which um, includes the practice question, the evidence, and the translation. So we use this to ensure that the latest research findings and best practices are quickly and appropriately incorporated into patient care. So again, it's all about providing the best possible care that we can for our patients. So which activity forms the bridge between nursing theory and practice? B, evidence-based research. Okay, evidence-based research is the translational research that forms the bridge between theory and practice. Theoretical writing focuses on the theory, client-focused care and case management focus on the practice. So we're asking the clinical questions in the PICO format. So the burning clinical question is asked in population, patient, problem. Okay, that's our P. I for intervention. C for comparison. O for outcome. And T for time. So an example of a PCOP format statement is in patients greater than 65 years old. So that's our population, all right? Um, how does the flu vaccine, that's our intervention, versus no vaccine, that's our comparison, risk the development of pneumonia, okay? That's the outcome during the flu season. So what it's really asking us is, if someone that was older than 65 got a flu shot versus someone who did not get a flu shot, okay, how much more were they likely to get pneumonia 
than the person who got the flu shot. So if I didn't get, if I'm over 65 and I did not get a flu shot, how much more likely am I to get pneumonia during the flu season than the person who did get the flu shot? And there is a correlation there. And we now know that in patients that are at high risk, not only are we going to give them a pneumonia vaccine, but we're going to give them a high dose flu vaccine, especially if they're over 65, so that they don't get either one during the flu season. But research has shown us that that's true, okay? So if you have a question, like you want to know how does something correlate or how is something going to affect the outcome of something else, then this is how you would state the question using the PICO format. So you want to know what each one of these acronyms stand for. So remember, P is always about people or problem. I is always about your intervention. C is comparing that intervention to not doing the intervention. O is how did it turn out? What was the outcome? And T, what was the time frame? So the time frame for these patients were the flu season. Your time frame could be longer. It could be shorter. So in a research journal, there are different components, okay? The abstract. The abstract is going to give you a summary about that article. And it usually tells you why we did the study, um, who the subjects were in the study, what kind of data was collected, what type of analysis we did, and anything important will be summarized in that abstract. The intro. Um, this is going to tell us about other studies that were conducted about this particular topic. Okay. And it might have a statement of the specific goals or the purpose of the study. The method. This is how we're going to do the study. Okay. And that will include the type of study, how many subjects will be included, the research design that we used, how the data was collected, and what data was collected, um, how we did the analyzation and what the results of the analyzation were. And there should be enough information so the study could be replicated or repeated if needed. The results, okay? This is um, how the study turned out. And so, you know, most authors are gonna use two different forms. They're gonna use words and also a chart or a table or a graph. So that when someone understands, they can put the two things together and really understand what the results were and what they mean. Discussion. Um, this is a report that tells us what the results mean in regards to what study we did, the literature reviewed, and our analyzation. And then references. Okay, what references um, did we use that support our research and our findings? When you read or you re critique a research article, you want to review the elements of the article. You're determining the level and the quality of the evidence used using a scale. And you'll decide if the study is applicable to your practice. Is this something that you're currently engaged in or that would help you know, with something that you're incur currently engaged in? Um, we talk about research because it generates new knowledge. So it's valuable for us. It helps us improve the quality of healthcare and the experience of the patient and the quality of care that they receive. Okay. Um, the HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration, defines quality improvement as a systematic and continuous action that helps us provide measurable improvement in healthcare services and in the health status of the patients that we're doing the study about. So let's say our um, targeted patient group was diabetic patients. So the study that we're going to do is going to improve that patient population. Nursing has two essential elements a body of knowledge and the application of that knowledge in nursing care and interventions. The body of knowledge provides the rationale for nursing interventions. 
Knowledge comes from a variety of sources, which may be traditional, meaning um, it's something they've always done. We don't really know why, but it's something that they've always done. Authoritative, it comes from a person of expertise or scientific, it comes from a scientific background. We have science, science that supports it. The type of knowledge, science, okay? This comes from science, right, and research. Philosophy, philosophy, remember this is an idea and process, like the nursing process. Florence Nightingale influenced nursing knowledge and practice. She demonstrated efficient, knowledgeable nursing care. She defined nursing practice as a separate and distinct from the medical practice and she differentiated between health nursing and illness nursing. Women became more independent and, and assertive, especially after World War II, which helped us to explode that knowledge out there. It also brought women out of the home into the workforce and it required them to be more independent and they wanted more knowledge as a result of that. Okay, so um, this helped to define um, an identity for nursing. It also helped to bring about unique contributions to the healthcare system. In the mid 20th century, nursing became more science-based and more accepted. Philosophical, philosophical beliefs and knowledge base for nursing practice began to evolve. So today we have the proliferation of graduate nursing programs. What does that mean, pro proliferation? It just means rapid growth. So we have this rapid growth of these graduate nursing programs, including we have the PhD in nursing. Remember, there's two different types. Um, and we have society's acceptance of nursing and science. Then nursing theories. Okay, these were um, developed to describe nursing. The nursing theory def differentiates nursing from other disciplines and activities that it serves the purpose of describing, explaining, predicting, and controlling the outcome of our nursing care practices. Nursing theories provide a means of being able to test knowledge through research and to expand the nurse's knowledge to meet healthcare needs of patients in our ever-changing society. Um, we have a few nursing theories. We have general systems theory. Remember that talks about how we break down each component and how it all works together as a system. Adaptation theory. That talks about how we adapt to the illnesses and the things that are going on around us. And developmental theory. This talks about human growth throughout different stages of life. And it's generally chronological like with Erickson. Okay, nursing theories help us identify and define concepts that are related to each other and that are important with nursing and that state the relationship between the uh, theory and the concept. Okay, theoretical frameworks of nursing provide a focus for nursing care activities. The person receiving the care is always the most important theme. But when we talk about nursing theorists, we talk about not only the person, but the environment, the health, and the nursing that we provide that is unique and specific to that particular theory. In nursing research, uh, we take broadly defined concepts about research that will help us improve the care of people in both the clinical setting, um, in the study of people and in the nursing profession. And this can include studies of education, policy development, ethics, or nursing history. Nursing research is conducted by quantitative and qualitative methodologies. Remember that quantitative is more about numbers and statistics. Uh, qualitative is more about words, phrases, phenomenons. <coughs> we use evidence-based practice in nursing to uh, do problem solving or to make a problem solving approach. And this helps us uh, determine what clinical decisions we should use what evidence we should use. Evidence-based practice is usually the best available resource that we can use. We can find it in published research um, and we use it for standards and guidelines. 
um, we can review different research and literature to see about different populations of people and how different things uh, correlate and how it affects that population or those particular people overall. It helps us blend the science and the art of nursing so that we achieve the best patient outcomes. A student nurse, ask an experienced nurse, why is it necessary to change the patient's bed every day? The nurse answers, I guess we have just always done it that way. This answer is an example of what type of knowledge? Traditional. Traditional. Okay, traditional knowledge is nursing practice from one generation to another without research to support it. Scientific is obtained through scientific knowledge, through research, and authoritative comes from an expert and is accepted as truth based on the person's expertise. A student nurse, I'm sorry, wrong one. A nurse is using John Hopkins nursing evidence-based practice model, PET, as the clinical decision-making tool. When delivering care to patients, which steps reflect the intended use of this tool? So remember PET, practice question, evidence, and translation. All right, so A, the nurse recruits an professional team to develop and refine an evidence-based question. So we do, we use um, practice, question, evidence, and translation. So this is a practice question. So A is definitely used for John Hopkins. How about B? A nurse draws from personal experience of being a patient to establish a therapeutic relationship. Is that a practice question, evidence, or translation? No, right? No. Uh we don't use our personal experience with the patient, okay? And don't use your personal experience to answer questions because 98% of the time you're gonna get the wrong answer. C, a nurse searches the internet to find the latest treatments for type two diabetes. Is that a practice question, evidence or translation? It's yeah. evidence, right? Evidence. Evidence. Okay, so, so far we have A and C. A nurse uses spiritual training to draw strength when counseling a patient who is in hospice for an inoperable brain tumor. Is that an example of a practice question, evidence or translation? No. No. A nurse questions the protocol for assessing post-op patients in the ICU. No. Yes. That is an example. Really? Yes, because she's using a question um, and she's looking at um, what their current protocols are. A nursing student studies anatomy and physiology of the body system to understand the disease states of an assigned patient. And that's a no. Okay, so the answers here are A, C and E. The John Hopkins evidence-based practice model is a powerful problem-solving approach to clinical decision making. Let me just flip this up so you guys can see the slide. And is accompanied by user-friendly tools to guide use okay it's specifically designed to meet the needs of the practicing nurse and it uses three steps in the process practice question evidence and translation the goal is to ensure that the latest research findings are the best and the best practices are quickly and appropriately incorporated into patient care steps include but are not limited to recruiting an interprofessional team developing and redefining the 
evidence-based practice question and conducting internal and external researches for evidence. So does that make more sense why E is true? Yes. Because you're questioning like, is this protocol really um, using evidence-based? So you're gonna redefine the question in that particular example, you're redefining it. A nurse is using general systems theory to describe the role of nursing to provide health promotion and patient teaching. Which statements reflect key points of this theory? Any, um, any thoughts here, guys? Which ones support general systems theory? So again, you wanna look these up, okay, in your book and, and learn them, all right? So for general systems theory, the whole system is always greater than the sum of its parts. Boundaries separate the systems from each other and their environment. And to survive, all open systems have to maintain a balance through feedback. According to general systems theory, the system is a set of interacting elements that contribute to the overall goal of the system. The whole system is always greater than its parts. So just like a car, right? A whole car is worth more than its parts. Boundaries separate systems from each other and their environments. Systems are hierarchy in nature and are composed of interrelated subsystems that work together um, so that a change in one element affects all other subsystems. In other words, it has a domino effect. And that's kind of the way the body works, okay? If one part of your body is not in homostasis, it can throw off your body's whole ability to compensate. To survive, all systems maintain balance through feedback. An open system allows energy, matter, and information to move freely between the systems and boundaries, whereas a closed system does not allow input from or output from or to the environment. <clears throat> a nurse manager schedules a clinic for the staff to address common nursing interventions used in the facility and explore how they can be performed to more efficiently and effectively. How they can be performed more efficiently and effectively, sorry. The nurse manager's actions to change clinical practice are an example of a situation described by which nursing theory? Okay, this is prescriptive theory. Prescriptive theories address nursing interventions that are assigned to control, promote, and change clinical nursing practice. Descriptive theories describe a phenomenon, event, a situation, or a relationship. Developmental theories outlines the process of growth and developments of humans and general systems theory describes how whole things break into parts and then learn how the parts work together in systems. When conducting quantitative research, the researcher collects information to support a hypothesis. This information would be identified as what? Variables. Okay, so when conducting quantitative research, data. the research collects information. Good, data. Data is the information collected. Data refers to information that the researcher collects from subjects in the study. And remember, if it's quantitative, a lot of times that it's going to be um, numbers. A variable is something that varies and has different values. It can be measured. Instruments are devices to collect and record the data. 
such as a rating scale or a pencil paper test or a biological measure? A nurse is conducting quantitative research to examine the effects of nursing protocols in the emergency department on patient outcomes. This is also known as what type of research? Quantitative. Remember we have quantitative and qualitative which ones were under quantitative versus qualitative? Experimental. Quasi-experimental, all right, is conducted in clinical settings to examine the effects of nursing interventions on patient outcome. Descriptive research is often used to generate new knowledge or topics with little or no prior research. Correlational research examines the type and degree of relationships between two or more variables, and experimental research examines cause and effect. A nurse studies the culture of Native Alaskans to determine how their diet affects the overall state of health. A method of qualitative research the nurse is using is what? Ethnography. Ethnography. Talks about culture. Okay, good. Ethnographic research is developed by the discipline of anthropology and is used to examine issues of a culture of interest to nursing. Historical research examines events of the past. Grounded theory methodology is discovery of how people describe their own reality and how the beliefs are related to their action in a social scene. And phenomenology is a philosophy and research method used to describe experiences as lived by the subject being studied. Give me one second, guys. I got to take this call. Okay, what does the letter P stand for in PICO? People, person, population. Population, okay. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay, so which one, D? D. E. Okay, good. The P in PICO represents description of the patient population or Interest I represents intervention, C represents comparison, O for outcome, and T for time. All right, let's see if we can bring up number three. 